We want to continue this morning in our sermon series that we began last week from the book of John. Well, actually the I am sayings and most of those occur in the book of John. So if you want to turn to John chapter 6, that's where we had our scripture reading this morning and where we're going to return for this message. As we think about Jesus speaking and saying in verse 35 of this text that we read this morning, I am the bread of life. My mother's maiden name was Spainauer. Maybe you've heard that name. Her grandmother on her uh, dad's side, her name was Viola, and uh, we called her Viley. Now, she, of course, would have been my great-grandmother, and there were three things that I remember about her as a child. She could do the work of ten men. She baked the best bread I've ever put in my mouth. And she was the meanest woman I have ever known. And uh, I don't know how those things may be mutually exclusive or not. I'm not sure, but uh, she was really something. But I still think about her bread today. Uh, I've never tasted any like it from any other place. And I've asked, I asked my mother when she was still uh, living uh, to tell me what she did that made it was so good, made it so, uh, so good. And, and I never can remember. I think she <clears throat> used a lot of baking soda that gave it a very unique kind of flavor. And she made it as pone bread. And you could, when it came out of the oven, you get a big chunk of it and slice it up and throw some butter in there. And I'm telling you, uh, heaven's got to have that on the menu, or I just don't know if I'm going to go or not, but that was good stuff. Bread, of course. Bread, of course, is one of what we learned in, when we were going to school, most of us, and of course they're throwing all this out the window now, but it used to be one of the four fruit groups along with uh, meat and dairy and fruits and vegetables. Uh, obviously, Snickers and ice cream should have been in there, but they weren't, but uh, uh, I guess ice cream uh, fell in the dairy category, but uh, uh, today, a lot of times, bread is kind of an afterthought for a lot of people. Now, in the, here in the South, and especially here in this part of the South and throughout um, where I grew up in North Carolina, bread is still a, a pretty much a big deal. And uh, But uh, for a lot of folks, um, unless it's, it's kind of an afterthought, unless you're at the roadhouse and you're eating their uh, yeast rolls or at... Uh, uh, red lobster and eating their biscuits or something. Bread's just not one of those things that everyone wants to focus on. But in Jesus' day, bread was a big deal. In fact, lots of meals consisted only of bread. It, you, it was so pr- important that when they spoke of eating a meal, they referred to it as what? Breaking bread. Breaking bread. Uh, that was a central idea and theme among that whole issue. Bread was the most important thing. It was, and it was so because it was a, a sweeping kind of meal. Now, you thought, what's that? Everyone had it. You know, a lot of today, some folks can't have this, and some folks can't, can't have that, or some folks have this or don't have that. But in, in Jesus' day, bread was the thing. It was a sweeping thing. It was a satisfying thing. It was a sustaining thing. It was a symbolic food, if you will, because it represented uh, friendship and fellowship. We even think about it relative to the Lord's Supper that we just observed. Uh, we even think of it when we hear the word uh, Bethlehem, which means what? House of bread. Yeah, house of bread. So bread was a pretty big deal. Now the context of the, the, the verses that we read during our scripture reading this morning began, of course, over in the first part of the chapter of, of John 6. And so if you want to look over there just for a second, you see, may see your heading there as you begin that chapter. Jesus feeds what? 5,000. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Well, I've got to tell this story while I'm here about the 5,000. You, you heard, heard about, hear about the preacher that... Uh, uh, they were preaching in in uh, uh, preaching class in seminary, and uh, uh, he had the young man had his sermon all prepared, and he and he stood up on a on on, on his day to preach, and he said, uh, "How many of you think you could feed five people on five thousand loaves of bread and and two thousand fish?" And one guy raised his hand and said, "Yeah, I believe I could." And so the young man he, he realized his mistake. He got so flustered that he just sat down and uh, 
and, and just withdrew from, from preaching. And so for, the, for that Sunday, well the, well, the next day, he, he was told in chapel he had to get up and preach again. And so he got it right this time. He stands up and he says, how many of you think you can feed 5,000 people with five, lo- five loaves and, and two fish? And the same person raised his hand and said, yeah, I believe I could. He said, well, how could you do that? He said, I thought I'd use what we had left over from yesterday. So uh, Jesus, is, uh, Jesus is called... Uh, to do some kind of thing here, if you will, that's going to help folk. In verse 5 of John 6, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Jesus immediately shifts into the mode of helping folk in this difficult situation. And uh, uh, we read the rest of the story. Story We read how uh, the disciples were able to locate a little boy, had some, had some bread and had some fish, and Jesus had everyone sit down, and he did this great miracle and, and uh, uh, performed uh, uh, this great work, and everyone had plenty to eat. Well, if you go over several verses, over to verse 25, uh, Jesus has left that crowd. He's already had this experience where he walks on the water. And when you get over to John, uh, verse 25 of John 6, you read these words. They go looking for him, by the way. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Now, in the original language, that terminology there, had your fill, means you stuffed yourselves like pigs. That's what it literally means. You stuffed yourselves like pigs. So Jesus said, you're looking for me not because you saw this great miracle I did and you believe that I'm someone special. You, you're doing this because uh, you had this great meal and you ate so much that you could hardly stand it. Um, you know, uh, in my neck of the woods, when I was growing up, when we did this, we would, uh, at the end of a meal, we put too much stuff inside of us. We said, I'm about to bust. Yeah, I'm about to bust. I've, I've eaten too much. And so that's what Jesus said here. You, you ate all this and that's why you're looking for me. They wanted a chance to get more. And so in subsequent conversation, you get down to verse 30, and it says, So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you do, or will you give, that we may see it and believe believe you? What will, what will you do? Now, this is interesting because they're saying, we, wanna, we want you to be able to demonstrate or prove to us that you are this person you're claiming to be. So what kind of miracle are you going to do to make that happen? Now look, <laughs> if you fed 5,000 people, plus women, men, plus women and children, with five loaves and two fish, I just don't know if there's much else you could do. Yeah, think about that. They're, they're, coming, they're asking, you've got to be able to do more than this. And Jesus is probably in his mind thinking, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. The Jews wanted to Jesus to do for them what Moses did. The miracle of feeding 5,000 plus was not enough. And it's that same old kind of thing that we get into all the time when we uh, somehow lose our allegiances to individuals or to places or to things. And that is, what have you done for me lately? Oh, yeah, yesterday you fed a bunch of us. You fed 5,000 plus women and children on, on just a little bit of food. You did that yesterday. But what have you done today, Jesus? We want to we see this today. And so they go on in verse 31 and say, uh, Our forefathers ate manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now, you may remember, of course, that uh, as the Israelites are in the desert and wandering around and they're complaining to Moses because they have no food and, and uh, eventually complain because they didn't have enough to drink either, but they have no food. And so in Exodus chapter 16, verse 15, uh, that whole section there is, is Moses laying out what God has actually done for them or doing for them relative to providing them with food. Back in 1996, uh, Atlanta hosted the Summer Olympics. Some of you may remember that. Some of you may have gone. I don't know. But initially when they, when they planned that, they came up with a little logo-like thing uh, that they put out and for the public to see and it was a little creature looking like thing, a kind of a funny little, little thing that was animated. It would do all kinds of stuff. And, and the line said, what is it? What is it? And eventually this little mascot, if you will, they, they thought uh, people didn't get it. And so they, they had a contest and renamed it Izzy. Izzy. I don't know if any of you remember Izzy, but you can look him up on, online and see what he looked like. But uh, the question that they posed was uh, that people, when they, when they put him out there was, what is it? 
And no one knew what it is because it was just something made up. Well, this is exactly what the, the nation of Israel asked Moses when manna fell from heaven. Essentially, the word manna in the Hebrew language means, what is it? They look out and they see it and they say, what's that? What is it? And, that, and that's the word manna in Hebrew. And so they, they see that. Exodus 16, 15, when the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? For they did not know it, what it was. And Moses said to them, it's the bread God has given you to eat. And of course, it, uh, by, by reading the description in the book of Exodus, it looks a lot like that styrofoam thing that you get when you use those uh, uh, pre, uh, you know, prepackaged communion sets. You know, that little styrofoam wafer in there that they call bread. That's kind of what, what this stuff looked like. Okay. So, uh, you know, they're coming at Jesus pretty hard. And so in verses 32 and 33, Jesus gives them an explanation to all this. He says, uh, uh, look, uh, let's think about the redeemers that we're talking about here. Moses brought you out of Egypt, and he was a quintessential uh, character for the Jews. He was the main forefather that they would always point back to when they talked about deliverance. Now, when they talked about faith, the main forefather they would talk about would be Abraham. When they talked about uh, ruling and governing and, and uh, uh, you know, conquering nations, they would always talk about David. And so they had all these different characters they talked about, but Moses is the one that's kind of Jesus is being held up to now as, a com- as in comparison. And they point to Moses and say, Moses... Uh, uh, you know, Moses did this stuff. He, he gave us this stuff out in the, in the wilderness. He gave our forefathers this, bre- this bread to eat. And uh, so they're saying to Jesus, look, if you're trying to compare yourself with Moses, you're just reaching for the stars because you ain't it. You ain't it. You, you're not going to be it. You're, you're just way, you're way, Jesus, you're nothing like Moses. Your miracles are nothing compared to his. And then Mo- Jesus points out something very interesting. Jesus says, uh, Moses didn't give you that wet bread. Uh, yeah, you think he called down bread, but he did not give you that bread. I mean, a great statement of truth there, one of many. Moses didn't give you this bread. You're, ta- you're giving him credit for something that he did not do. And I, I find that uh, people in general are really good about giving Folks either credit for something they didn't do or blame for they didn't something they didn't do. And usually, it's interesting, some people will say whatever the thing is, it was a good thing, and some people say it was a bad thing, and so the difference between wh- whether it's credit or blame is how you view whatever's turned out, whatever's happened. Moses didn't give you the bread. He only told you where to find it and how to collect it. He said, you go out and you gather up enough for each day, and, don't, and on the sixth day, you get enough for two days, you don't get any more. You make certain that you get just what you need. He said, Jesus says, uh, it, was, it was my Father that gave you this bread. And notice that he didn't say, it was God who gave you this bread. I think it's very telling, very important. Because he says, uh, he's priming them for something he's going to say a little bit later. He says, my Father is the one that's done this. And then he says, God has given you true bread. This manna kept them alive, but it was not meant to be the only thing they would ever eat from that point forward. It was very symbolic, if you will. If you will. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3 says, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. He's trying to say, look, this is not the only thing you're ever going to eat. You're going to eat stuff besides this manna. But you're being given this right now so that you can understand that this is this, uh, you know, God wants you to know that you don't live just on this physical stuff alone. You know, as in the, in the New Testament where Paul says, uh, food for the stomach and the stomach for food. And uh, as many of us, unfortunately, can attest sometime we... We, we build our whole lives around what we're going to eat and when we're going to eat and how much we're going to eat when we, when we get the opportunity. But Jesus said, look, God's bread is he who comes from heaven and gives life. It is not literal, physical 
bread like my grandma Viola used to make, but a spiritual bread that will do something much greater than any physical bread ever could. And so Jesus gives this explanation in those verses. And then you look in verse 34 and you see their response. And their response is based on on a real faulty understanding about this whole idea. They they thought of the Messiah, they thought of, 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 uh, in this regard, that this person was going to be the supplier of all their physical needs. In fact, the rabbis had a teaching that said when the Messiah comes, he will give everyone manna. (laughs) Well, if it doesn't get any better than that manna, he might as well just stay where he is because I don't believe I want any of that. But that's what they believed, that when this, when, this, when this Messiah would come, he would give everyone manna. Not only that, he would be the exalter of the Jewish nation. He would be, he would be the one that, was, that would uh, do for them what they'd been waiting for for years and years and years. And notice then, in verse 34, they say, Sir, now in fact, you may have that in your translations in the NIV. Sir, you might, may, might also have the term Lord. The actually, Lord is what is used there in the original. Now the Pharisees called Jesus a devil and a deceiver. His disciples called him Lord. And so you wonder if these people now are having any kind of sense at all as to, uh, as to who he was. But the bottom line was simply this. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Um... We don't know what you can do, but if you can do anything, go ahead and do that. (laughs) We have a tendency to be very... um, we people that settle for just anything. You know, just, just toss a few crumbs and that'll be enough for us. And notice how they say it. From now on, perpetually, from this day forward... And forevermore. Uh, the similar thing happened over in chapter 4, you may remember, with the woman at the well. You remember when she is in having this encounter with Jesus at the, uh, at the well in Sychar of Samaria? And uh, when Jesus says uh, that uh, he's the water of life, remember what she says? The woman said, in, this is John four fifteen. the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You know, give, you know, just go ahead and install this at the house, you know, uh, put in a pump over there or something, and I can just, I can just draw water from forever, and I won't have to come over here. And I think that's, uh, what, what are they asking? What is this group asking? What was the woman asking? Well, what they were asking was simply this, make life easy for us. If you're really a Messiah, if you really can do all the things, then make life easy. Because that's what they believed the Messiah would do. And this is very similar, unfortunately, to the promises that sometimes get made by those who preach and teach this idea of prosperity theology. That once you come to Jesus, you will never, ever, ever have another problem, issue, or difficulty in your entire life. If you're broke, God will open up all the coffers of heaven and you will just, he'll just pour it out and you won't have to worry about a thing. All your problems will be solved. Physical and financial blessings will literally just pour out of the sky. Now, that's a very different understanding than what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 11, where he's actually given us what we refer to as the model prayer. Remember, he said, when you're praying, you, you, ask, you say, give us this day what? Daily bread. Don't give us bread for next week or six months from now or perpetual. Give us daily bread which means I'm coming back to you again and again and again and again. The manna Jesus is talking about is something that comes daily. And that's why there are a lot of folks that get uh, discouraged or disillusioned, if you will, with Christianity from time to time. You know, they think, well, you know, uh, I tried that for six weeks, and man, it just didn't work. (laughs) Well, I tried that, you know, for two whole days, and I didn't see a bit of improvement. That's what happens. And so when Jesus hears that, he responds then with our main focus is verse 35. I'm the bread of life, and you who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes me will never be thirsty. Now, 
This, according to most scholars, is the first of the I am sayings of Jesus. Of course, we used the one last week from John chapter 4 where it was kind of hidden, if you will. But we are reminded every time we see Jesus use this that he, re, he, he, he frames it in such a way that we cannot help but make the connection that he had with his Father and what God said about himself. We remember it Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, where Moses is inquiring of God about going to Egypt. And he says to God, well, what if I go down there and these people ask me what God sent me? What am I going to say? What's his name? We want, to, we want to be able to call him something. And, of course, God revealed that to him. God said to Moses, is Exodus three fourteen, I am who I am. And this is what you're to say to the, to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. I am, Jesus says, I am the bread, that which sustains spiritually. You know, Jesus himself quoted that verse that we used a moment ago, I think from Deuteronomy, which says, you know, uh, in Matthew 4, when he's being tempted by Satan, and Satan comes to him and says, take these stones here and turn them into bread. And that way, you, you know, you're, you're hungry, you're starving, you need something to eat. So take these stones and turn them into bread. And Jesus says, man will not live by the physical sustenance of bread alone. There's more to it than that. The bread that he says, the bread I'm talking about is greater than any bread the Hebrews have ever enjoyed. I am this bread. I am the bread of life, real life. Life that's, that pr- promotes a relationship with God that's made possible by Him. You see, and it's unfortunate that people haven't, a lot of people haven't realized this, but life without Jesus is just existence. It's just being here. And so what does all that mean for us? All the things that Jesus said and all the, we see all this kind of play out. What does it mean for us? Well, there's three things, and I want to mention them very quickly. First of all, it means that we should look for no other spiritual bread than Christ. We should look for no other spiritual bread than Christ. How many of you have ever heard this, someone say, um, I found it in the last place I looked? You ever, you ever heard anybody say that? Have you ever said it yourself? Do you know why it's true? Because when you find it, what happens? You stop looking. It's always in the last place you look. Even if the last place was the first place you looked. So if you can skip over all the places that it isn't and look in the last place first, you'll always get it. You won't have to worry about it, right? And that's the problem that the world has. Looking looking all the other places first. Even in the Bible, that was true. And Jesus, in, in, in early on in his, well, a year or so into his ministry, when things were going so well for him, John the Baptist is arrested and put into prison. And remember what happened? Matthew chapter 11, verse 2 and following. When John heard in prison that what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to him to ask him, are you the one that was to come or should we expect someone else? John still in the midst of his imprisonment. He still has issues. And Jesus replied to those that were sent, Go back and report to John what you have heard and what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. And and John, in, in prison, you know, I would think in prison would be one of those places you might contemplate checking out of spiritually. Man, this is for the birds. I'm not going to stay locked up because of believing in something that may not be true. And so, as I mentioned earlier, scores of people become dissatisfied or disillusioned with this whole idea. The problem is they don't know what they're supposed to be looking for. And and, and at the end of the sixth chapter of John, we come to that when Jesus is in dialogue with his disciples. And and, uh, uh, in in verse 68, uh, Peter says to Jesus, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, that's what we should be seeking. And if we don't seek that, we're going to, you know, we're going to have some issues. And if we, if we really seek that, then we, we need to land 
on the one who can actually give that, which is Jesus himself. So we should look for no other spiritual bread than that of Christ. Secondly, we should rest in the sustaining presence and power of Christ. Be content with Christ as our all in all. And it's interesting, um, in that Matthew text I read a moment ago about John being in prison, if, if that's in the beginning of chapter 11, if you go to the end of chapter 11 of Matthew, Jesus says this. They kind of function as bookends, if you will, of all the things that's in between. Jesus says this, Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and following, Come to me, all, who, all you who are weary and are burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for, my, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I'm sure John would love to have heard that. Rest in the sustaining presence and power of Christ. And lastly, we should continue to mine the spiritual treasures of Christ. There's five ways of doing that. I'm just going to read them off. I'm not going to talk about them. You see, it's this, we need more than a superficial or static faith and relationship to Jesus. And so here's how we, how we fix that. We spend time in the Word reading it. We spend time studying the Word. We spend time worshiping the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a, in a presence like this. We spend time in fellowship with other, other individuals. We spend time in service as God has called us. And so we should continue to mine the spiritual treasures of Christ. And when we do that, you know, this is where Jesus is leading us. And we can understand and get the experience of Him being the bread of life. I got to tell you, I would give anything, anything that I can think of to have a piece of my great-grandma's bread, even though if she served it while she was mean doing it, okay? That's how good it was. But even if I had it, even if I had it, I know I'd get hungry again. It wouldn't be enough to, to keep me going forever. It would be nice to taste it, but it wouldn't keep me going forever. I'd get hungry again. But the spiritual bread, which, which is Christ himself, causes me to seek and to, or crave no other spiritual bread because it is perpetually satisfying when I feed on it. It's perpetually satisfying when I feed on it. And I would like to think that that's true of all of us here today. I, I don't know if it is or not, but I would like to think that would be our, the, our own personal testimony that, that our lives are greatly enhanced when we spend time participating in the spiritual bread known as Jesus. If you're here today and you've never dined on him for the first time, you've never delved into the truths that he is who he claims to be and confessed him as Lord and Savior, we give you that opportunity. But for the rest of us, it's, Jesus is, is really pointed about it becoming a priority for us to make certain that we are feeding on him the bread of life because we're not going to we're not going to uh, make it through this world. We're not going to be sustained spiritually enough to do that with any other food other than Jesus. If you're here today and you need to make some kind of decision, we offer you this opportunity. We're going to stand and sing a hymn decision. And if you have a decision on your heart today, we invite you to come with stand. Okay.